All day long we manoeuvred between Hook Point and Sable Head, but could make no headway. We were soaked to the bone and hanging from the safety ropes like spiders in the autumn frost. Taint a clock in the evening old goat called the officers to a meeting. They decided to seek refuge in Dublin. We set folks sail, sails, sailed all night and in the morning found ourselves near Dublin. It was hiding in the fog. Low-hanging clouds seemed to sweep the sea with tails of rain. The storm continued. By eleven o'clock we could see a long row of masts marking the harbour road, like an avenue of poplars on a misty morning. We looked for the floating lighthouse and the boys, but could see nothing in the fog. Suddenly the signalman shout. Dunker on the port side. From the bridge, the officer of the watch commanded. Hmm, hard to port. I stood in the middle of the ship with a rope in my hands. Old goat jumped on deck and shout. Nerthy grop anchor, we're sinking. At the same moment there was a thud. The ship shuddered. The old man shout. All aft, put on your life belts. There was that thud again. We were firmly aground. The waves rolled over us, the sails slapped against each other, the foremast swayed as if about to collapse. Hmm, set the top halyards, shouted old goat. We seemed to be climbing a tree that was being chopped. Kramer cursed and slowly climbed up the cables. We saw him hang from the cylinder and pull out a knife. The sails collapsed to the deck. It's again an ominous sound from below. Then another and another, a long rolling rumble. The ship was free. It was being carried sideways towards the shore. A hoarse scree. Said she's controllable. Hmm, to the folks, brace. Prepare to drop anchor, shouted the old man. Hamburg turned slowly and started to move. The ship was saved. Old Goat took a breath. Everyone heard it because he was still holding the megaphone to his mouth. He was breathing like a steam engine letting off steam. A carpenter appeared on deck. Near three feet of water ahead, three and a half in the middle, three and a half aft, he reported in a harsh voice. Is it coming up? Old Goat asked. It seems steady. Good. Check back in ten minutes. We moved slowly towards the dark strip of shore in a grey shroud of rain. Now the anchor's ready, shouted old goat. Shirt asked mate beep. All clear. The ship turned clumsily to the wind. K. Take the sails to the gittos and drop anchor, came the command from the bridge. As the sails beat with a loud slapping sound, the anchor chain rattled. The bow anchor is given. Fixed command. Re dropped the starboard anchor. The clanking of the chain suddenly diminished, and in the silence we heard three short metallic blows, as if a steel hammer had been beaten on the iron plating of the ship. We stood frozen, not realizing what had happened. Only the sailing master. The ghost is knocking. Chinna door swung open. Chips rocked forward, took a few uncertain steps, and collapsed on the deck. Franz Bowler ran in after him with a shout. The starboard chain had burst. We crowded round chips. Someone knelt down and tried to lift his head. I rubbed his forehead. His hair had turned grey. The chain broke as links smashed into the board, Bowler said, panting. Three links passed close to Chips' head. All three are stuck in the side. Look, he's all grey. Me prepare the rockets. Distress signal. The captain ordered from the bridge. We were in a panic. Distress call. It's the end. The Hamburg again turned sideways into the storm and drifted towards the shore. There was no way to steer it. It moved helplessly at the will of the waves and wind like a piece of wood. There was a cracking sound all over the ship. Then again, we were sinking for the second time. A distress call was put out. Flares flashed high above the ragged sails. A new order came from the bridge. Methany turn. Prepare the boats, the crew to take the documents. We ran to the cockpits. When we stopped, Jonas grabbed my hand and pointed to the hatch. Rats, he whispered. A wave shattered the hatch cover and outrolled huge fat creatures with sharp faces and long tails. Hell's brood. Look at those damn rats, Jonas repeated. That was the signal. 
Bola, Jonas and Flatera swooped down on the animals with shouts of rage and drove them across the deck with kicks and rods. The restrained rage of the last days and nights found an outlet in a frenzied, senseless chase. We chased the rats like men possessed. It was getting dark. As the tide came in, the waves smashed the ship more and more. Flatera hit a rat with a piece of wood, grabbed its tail and lifted it up. It did not die and squealed in an almost human voice, continuing to squeal and scratch. It tried to free itself before he threw it overboard. Ish, now much water is in the ship, shouted the captain. After a while he was answered. My fan tea. Four feet in front, four and a half in the middle. Soon after five o'clock a lifeboat came up and took us on board. Old Goat sat down on the bow. His face was as pale as wax, his lips compressed, and he stared at the wreck of the Hamburg, holding the ship's chronometer between his knees. It was night when we reached Dublin. We were driven through the dark streets and put up in a Salvation Army hostel. There was no liquor, just tea and sandwiches. The Salvation Army people sang a hymn and we were invited to join in. We didn't know the words, but the tune was similar to our songs, so we sang with clenched hands. Have you seen our old ship? Ho, 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 ho. By morning the storm had abated, and we set sail for the Hamburg. The deck superstructures were washed away with a foot of water in the cabins. The ship was in a terrible state. Day and night we worked at the pumps. The wheat began to smell. We had to haul the sacks on deck and throw them overboard. Thirty-four thousand sacks, enough to feed a whole regiment for a year. We stood off Dublin for six weeks. We were very popular in the town for our piety, for the Salvation Army boys had been praising our fervent, singing on the night of the wreck. Besides, we were Germans, and England's enemy was Ireland's friend. Usually in the cinema there was applause when German troops appeared on the screen, while the English were greeted with meows and whistles, so it was in 1925. Tunis the fate of Hamburg was sealed six weeks lakes, a general crash. The old goat flew to Hamburg to report to the owners. We were collected on the Lutzo and brought to Bremerhaven as third-class passengers, sailors without a ship. There we were separated. Only Harry Stover, Vitekek, and myself remained together. We decided to enlist at the maritime office in Hamburg. We arrived there on an unlucky day in December just before Christmas. The lights were on in the office on Admiral Strauss. The little bold man behind the desk looked at us as we entered and continued to write. A man in black sitting in the back of the room got up from his chair and came towards us. It was old goat. I think we should shake hands, he said, extending his bony hand. We bowed and shook it. Then we were given our papers. As we walked out by the cake seek, he got off cheap again. I prefer grog. We went to the office to get the money. We paid Stover first, then Vitek. It was my turn. You owe us five marks, said the clerk. Hmm. What did you say? I said you owe us five marks, the clerk repeated kindly. The cheerful young man wanted to get rid of us quickly. But how is that possible? Mur, please read it for yourself. And he handed me a paper. It was an account for young Gunter Prine, written by the old goat himself. It began with a pair of boots for 45 marks, followed by a long list of cigarettes, thread, needles, and other odd things I'd nicked on board. I stared at the paper. Odd prices, I said. You could buy a ship with that money, Vitatek laughed. But I didn't care about laughing. I had worked for six months, I was cold, I was hungry, I was unhappy. I had blisters on my hands, and all for that. Mm, how am I going to get home? I asked, trembling with rage. The company has prepared an advance for you, a fourth-class fare, the clerk explained graciously. You bloody, I began. Stover put his broad paw on my shoulder. Mish it up, my boy. Take your money and let's go. You'll get nothing more from these scumbags. I sighed, and we left. Don't worry, Prin, said Vitasek on the stairs. We'll work something out. You can come with us. Mm, I'll pay for you, said Stover, playing with the money in his pocket. Me too, added Vitekek. 
It's a sailor with money in his pocket is a lord. Stover whistled a taxi, and we went to Pauli's, the woman Vitek wanted to see. The girl seemed too lax for him, so we drove to Tattersall. The distance was only a few steps, but Harry Stover insisted that the gold galoon doorman call him a taxi. He refused to take a single step on foot as long as there was money in his pocket. There was nothing much in Tattersall either, as it was holiday time, so we drove to Tritcher, then to Alcazar, drinking at each place. No, Chili Stover said, mimicking old goat's voice. We ended up on a black couch in Hermine Hansen's house. Itatek sat on the right, Stover on the left, me in the middle. We drank until tears spilled from our eyes. Harry Stover mumbled. One more voyage, Prin, and I'll have money to buy the Star of David, you know, near the harbour. It's a gold mine. It'll always be buzzing there, and you'll get as much beer and as much grog as you drink when you come. Let's drink to that. Hey, miss. The sleepy girl behind the counter hesitated and brought three grog and water, because only her mine, Hansen, had rum. We drank without interruption. After the sixth glass, Stover blew his bosun whistle, which surprised everyone. He paid the bill, and we left, as my train was leaving at four in the morning. The taxi brought us to the station. Swaying, we walked hand in hand along the platform. The train had already been served. It was brightly lit. We swore we'd never leave each other. The man in the red cap signaled, and I managed to jump into the carriage as the train was pulling out. Stover and Vitekek stood hugging each other on the platform and singing. Floating home, floating home. Sailing home across the seas. I pulled up anchor on my way home. A few weeks later I returned to Hamburg and joined the Porfelsberg, a big cargo ship bound for South America. You are on a beautiful ship, the carrier said to me as he took me on board. He pointed to an ugly black steamer packed with derricks. When they're all working at a hundred degrees in the shade, you'll see for yourself, he nodded understandingly. We were already approaching the ship. With a bag over my shoulders, I climbed up the storm ladder. I was met by a small, broad-shouldered man with a round face and a flat nose, the boson of the lorry. What do you want? he asked. I showed him my papers. Well, let's have a look, nodded the boson. Why not? I replied. He shrugged his shoulders. No, go ahead. He pointed with his finger toward a room on the tank. It was a narrow, low cabin. In the middle were six bunks, tied in pairs with wire one above the other. Along the walls were tin lockers. Two lamps without shades burned white as chalk day and night. I looked round. The linen on the bunks was dirty. The locks on the lockers were padlocked. I thought of the Jewish temple on the Hamburg. It was nice there. Everything was made of wood, bunks against the walls. No one locked the lockers. There are no thieves in the sailing fleet. A young boy with a cigarette hanging out of the corner of his mouth staggered into the cabin and stared at me curiously. Where did you come from? I was taken in as a sailor. Ah, he answered without interest. And you? I asked. No, I'm a cabin boy here. You can't be. I said, remembering how I had been received on the Hamburg when I was a boy. Tell me, do you think you can talk to sailors? Leaning slightly, he watched me unpack. This of course. But not with me. You understand? When I was a cabin boy, I had to respect the sailors. He took out his cigarette and stared at me in amazement. Then he turned and sprang out of the cockpit, crowing like a rooster, and ran aft in his squeaky shoes. Half an hour later they called for food, and I went into the mess hall, a small room with benches along the walls and a narrow table in the middle. Fourteen grown men were eating without pleasure, sucking broth through their teeth. Younger sat among them. I shouldered two of them. As I sat down, a huge sailor in a short-sleeved shirt raised his head. Ah, the new sailor, he said, continuing to eat noisily. The youngster chuckled. I looked at the sailor carefully. He looked rough, with a broad face, eyebrows cocked over small, deep-set eyes, teeth like a wolf's. The open collar of his shirt showed a tattoo of a ship's mast, and on his hairy forearm a picture of a man and a woman. They moved when he moved his arm. It was Mayland, 
the scourge holding the entire crew in obedience. Where did you come from? asked my neighbour, a short man with a face like a dried apricot. To the sailing ship Hamburg. Working for a lousy id, I suppose. Suddenly everyone raised their heads and stared at me. I realised what the carrier was getting at. Clearly, a man working for a master's licence couldn't be popular on board. Yes, I replied. Everyone continued to eat in silence, but now I could feel the hostility. As I was leaving after lunch, the scourge grabbed my arm. Listen, you shit, we don't want a bump in the road here. We all piss in the same pot, you understand? Without waiting for an answer, he, a tower of meat and bone, pushed me away. A week later, as the sailing began, so did the grueling daily routine of scrubbing and knocking off the rust, knocking off the rust and scrubbing. By the time we finished cleaning the stern, the bow was already dirty again. Rust appeared everywhere, on the pipe, on the bow, on all the machinery like mould on bread. We beat it off with a hammer and scraped it off with a scraper. Then we rubbed it with a wire brush, covered it with a liffer, then with dried oil and finally we painted it. This went on from morning till night, scraping, a liffing covering with Zurich painting. You didn't feel like a sailor, but an auxiliary labourer in a huge factory floating on the sea. But when I had to keep watch at the helm or signalman, I was happy. That, at least, is a sailor's job. One day I was kneeling in front of a pipe, scrubbing off paint and a thick layer of rust, when Malan's voice sounded behind me. Nice work, eh? I didn't want to mess with this thug, said nothing, and kept working. You don't want to talk. All right, but listen to me good. You can crawl in front of the scumbags on the bridge. It doesn't bother me. He spit under my feet. Lick their ass if you want. It's your way of getting a goddamn eye. I felt the blood boil in me, but kept myself under control. I turned and looked at him. He smiled. Well, I said speak up. So I stood up with the hammer in my hands. You went to college, you dirty bastard, and that's all the difference between you and me. But you piss me off and here's why. He spit again. The first mate told me, Prin works better than get a move on. Move faster. What chutzpah. I'd like to see him do it himself. Prin this, Prin that, Prin say a a a. He spat on the deck again. I remained silent, and he went on. I'm working. They can't do it without people like me, and I'm not going to bust a gut, even though you might like it. I decided to beat his rudeness with politeness. Now listen to me. It's easy to abuse and cheat. And frankly, Mayland, if you're doing less than me, you're cheating because you should be doing more. You're older, more experienced, and you get more. So it's not my fault if you start getting chased around. He spat again, looked at me dumbly, turned and stooped and walked away. Arrogant prick. He wants an ID. I'll give you such an ID. The voyage was uneventful until we reached hell. It's the name given to the tropical part of South America, where the temperature in the shade rises to 40 degrees Celsius. We worked day and night, unloading and loading, sometimes in four ports a day. Everyone was working. There were no freelancers. I didn't see much of the crew because at half-hour breaks we'd roll into our bunks like sacks and sleep without undressing. One night in San Antonio I was assigned to watch at the hold while the others went ashore to drink. I would have been glad to go with them. The hold was illuminated by the bright light of arc lamps. Brown-haired longshoremen, whose backs glistened with sweat, were unloading crates of wine from the Lexos. They were nimble rascals and I had to make sure they didn't hide in the darkness with the other goods. The hold looked like a warehouse of all sorts of goods. Water closets and pictures of saints, razor blades and carpenter's tools all jumbled together. At midnight during the midnight break, the movers sat down below on the quay, and I went on deck where it was calm and cool. The city was rising on a hill twinkling with thousands of lights. It looked like a sparkling wave stretching up to the towering Andes. The noise of the returning crew came from the quay. They were all well paddled and swayed on the storm trap as they climbed to the deck. Beach Mayland walked ahead. Leaning towards me, he asked Venomous. On watch again? Licking arse again? You snot-nosed bastard. No, bastard myself, I replied. 
He hesitated for a moment, looking at me like a madman. What did you say? He growled. The same thing you said. He took a deep breath. We stood face to face, the others surrounding us in a hostile ring. In the dim light of the deck lamps, I couldn't make out their faces. The third mate approached from the bar. Oh, damn tears. Come aft and I'll beat the crap out of you, Mayland muttered, turning to leave. The others followed him. I knew I'd have to fight sooner or later, so I figured I'd take his challenge here and now. When I got to the stern, I had to make my way like a boxer going into the ring. People were standing in the cramped passage between the mess hall and the deck, which had apparently been left for spectators to see through the open door of the goblet room. Martin's asleep on a bunk, and a scourge was standing in the middle playing with his muscles. I walked over to the bunk, took off my jacket, hung it on the rack, then we turned to each other. 190 pounds of weight against 130. Of your snit, give it to him, squealed the youngster. The others were silent. I assumed my fighting stance, waved my arms, and danced towards him. He stood like a block. His fists, heavy as hammers, were carelessly lowered. He was showing that he was not afraid of me. Mm, come, come, you bastard, he taunted. I lunged and hit him in the chin with my right, but missed, shaking his head two or three times, as if to clear the water from his ears. Mayland walked slowly towards me. There was little room for movement between the bunks and the wall. He swung wide. I rolled back, but his blow struck me in the ear. I felt a sharp pain and felt blood running down my neck. Now Mayland was coming at me with his arms outstretched, trying to grab me. I realized that if he squeezed me with his hands, it would all be over at once. I jumped back, grabbed his right thumb and pulled back as hard as I could. He fell to his knees with a groan. Let go, you stinking bastard. I increased the pressure. I knew he'd kill me if I let him out. Drops of sweat stood out on his forehead. Let go, for God's sake, he shrieked. I pressed as hard as I could. There was a crack. The finger was broken. God Almighty! Then, more obediently, in a different voice. Let go, for God's sake! I let go and carefully retreated a few paces. He remained sitting on the floor, clutching his broken finger. Like most physically strong people, he didn't know how to endure pain while taking punishment. The onlookers entered the cubicle and silently made their way to their bunks. I walked over to the locker and looked in the mirror inside it. My ear almost came off from its blow. I pressed a handkerchief to it and went to the watch officer to get help. Oh, how the hell did you do that? The third mate asked. The crate fell, I answered. The scourge came in, holding up his broken finger. I fell, he said hoarsely. The third grinned. How do you like that? A crate falls on Prine and rips off his ear, and you fall and break your finger. You'd come up with a better story by tomorrow morning. If you tell the captain this one, he'll hang you both. When I returned with a bandaged head, I was met by a hostile silence. I pretended not to notice anything and changed my clothes. Ten minutes later, Mayland came in. His bandaged finger was sticking out like a candle. No, Prin didn't bring it, he said, and peace reigned. For the next few days, we treated each other with refined politeness. Fourteen days later, however, at Taltal, he and two other sailors left the ship. The passion for vagrancy had again seized him. This desire no scourge could resist. He wanted to go to Diamantino, and he did, but in doing so he lost all his earnings. Although no one has hit on me since then, it didn't add to my popularity. I was still the man who works for the credentials, but I beat Mayland and everybody respected me for it. There's a knock at the door. Mr. Pree and Mr. Bustler wants you on the bridge, said the steward. I jumped out of my bunk and went to the washstand. Through the window, I could see part of the San Francisco's promenade deck, and beyond that the busy harbour of Hamburg. The sun was shining, everything seemed bright and cheerful. A large mirror, a Cretan sofa, a wide bed with many drawers below, all promised a pleasant life on board. I put on my new uniform with the narrow gold ring on the sleeve and adjusted my cap in front of the mirror. I was the fourth mate on the San Francisco. 
with my helper's license and radio operator's certificate in my pocket, I had made it to the bottom rungs of the ladder to success. I nodded to myself in the mirror and stepped out. The first mate greeted me on the bridge. Merci, please, Mr. Priane. Approach the American immigration officer and escort the passengers to the ship. I saluted and stepped out. At the pier, I took a taxi. The wooden immigration building was packed like a railway station. Men, women, children crowded in groups. Carriers shouted, and here and there doctors in white coats pushed through the crowd. It was the first time I had ever encountered passengers. They huddled around me like flies around a sweaty horse and peppered me with silly questions. One elderly lady with sparkling eyes wondered if there would be dancing on the ship, and if sailors were allowed to dance. A heavily perfumed gentleman wanted to know if precautions had been taken in case of a crash. Finally I got everyone into the bus and we drove to the harbour. On board I handed the chattering crowd over to the stewards and went to report to the bridge. There I saw the third mate whom I had not yet met. We got to know each other. His name was Schwarzer. Did you get the passengers safely on board, Mr. Preen? He asked. They're charming. Note the women. At sea they all seem to be in great need of support. I have had several instances. I was somewhat surprised by these words, because Schwarz's upturned nose and huge ears did not look particularly sexy. A small, plump man appeared on the bridge. He was very elegant in a dark coat and hat, the captain, I realized. Schwarz stood at attention. I introduced myself. He gave me a brief, probing look with small grey eyes and muttered, Nothing to you, Mr. Prian, and went to his quarters. Now he's still chasing us, Schwarzer said calmly, orienting us by the stars, filling out the logbook, keeping track of the luggage, keeping watch and all that. I'll tell you, it's a dog's life. We walked side by side on the bridge. The passengers dressed in warm coats stood on deck and watched us. Glancing at them from time to time, we felt on top of the world. He was twenty-three, I was twenty. We left Hamburg on the 11th of March. It was a cold grey night, it was snowing. It started just as I took dog watch at four o'clock, and soon became so thick that I could hardly distinguish an outstretched hand. We were following the Weezer and were about the height of the lighthouse at Hochschweig. San Francisco was travelling at a moderate speed, and the foghorn sounded at short intervals. Bustler stood on the bridge beside the pilot, deciding whether to anchor or not. If the blizzard intensifies, it must be decided whether to anchor or not, but in any case we must be prepared. Mr. Preen, find a carpenter and clear the anchor, said the first man. I ran below. The deck was empty and dark, with no lights burning. A foghorn sounded regularly. I banged on the door with both fists, summoning the carpenter. After a while he appeared with lantern in hand, swaying with fatigue. We went to the starboard anchor. The carpenter switched on the lantern and I bent down. Suddenly right in front of us I saw a huge wall of white light. Turning round I shouted as loud as I could. The light is just ahead. I don't know if the bridge heard me, as the horn was now sounding continuously. The light was fast approaching. It was already five hundred feet away, and there was not enough time to reach the bridge. I shouted again with all my might. Oh, the light is just ahead. A dark shadow moved in front of me, the signalman. Oh, run, I shouted to him, wake everyone up and bring them upstairs. He disappeared like lightning. Sna's voice came from the bridge. Starboard. Then came a sharp, shrill whistle of steam, but the light remained steadily right on our course. Through my hood I could hear the signalman shout, Everybody out of your bunks if you want to stay alive. The next moment a huge black wall rose like a tower before me. A ferocious blow threw me to the deck, amid the rattle of iron. The ship turned to starboard. The words of command came from the... Stop both engines. Both engines full astern full to port. San Francisco turned clumsily and slid along the high sides of the other ship. About a hundred glowing windows shone above us. Then the ship disappeared into the fog like a vision. I ran downstairs to see if there was any damage. 
One of the rooms was torn open, the rope hatch damaged. Wind was blowing through the torn steel plates. It's a miracle no one was hurt. When I got to the bow, the starboard anchor was rattling down. I ran to the bridge. Cabin doors swung open and excited passengers appeared. A hysterical female voice shouted, Help! Arthur, we're drowning! And a deep bass replied, Don't worry, my sweet, I can swim. The captain was standing in the wheelhouse. He had just got out of bed, and it was clear he was ill. His head was burning with fever. Have you not seen this ship before? He threw to me. No, sir. Have you seen what it's called? No, sir. He swallowed a curse. The first officer turned to me. Did you see the damage? All above the water lane. Stepping back to the window, the captain drummed his fingers on the frame. Me, he saw something, he muttered. Mr. Prynne tried to find out the name of this vessel, the first man ordered. I saluted. The first one answered, but the captain ignored me. In the radio operator's cabin, I bent over a Morse key. I sent out signal after signal calling all ships. I am the San Francisco, caught in a collision near Hotchwag. Give me the name of the other ship. At first, no response. Then a faint buzz. This is the rescue ship, ready to leave Bremerhaven at full speed. Do you need help? No help needed, I replied. These marine predators have adapted to pitching a tug and then taking half the cost of the ship into their pockets for the rescue. I faint at last came the signal of the steamer Carlsery. Filled on. A long pause. I waited full of apprehension as though I hoped that nothing serious had happened. The old man was certainly angry with me, but I couldn't understand why. Then the signal came again. San Francisco. No assistance required. Carl's he. I ripped off my headphones, jumped up and ran to report to the captain. By this time, all the passengers were out of their cabins. In furs and warm coats, they stood on deck. One of them stopped me. It was the man who had asked me about precautions. Are you the fourth mate? He asked. Let me tell you something. I heard everything, young man. Everything. It is an absolutely incredible and outrageous thing that has happened. His voice grew louder and more agitated, and a crowd was gathering round. You ordered the crew to be woken up, he turned to the others. Do you know what he said? He said, get up, all of you, if you value your lives. That's what he said. I'm sorry, but I didn't say that. Oh, are you calling me a liar? Think about it, ladies and gentlemen. The crew is awakened when the ship is in danger. And we passengers can just drown, they don't care. Some of the passengers muttered their disapproval and indignation. The fat man was thrilled to have found an audience. I later learnt that he was an opera singer. Those were strange orders, I must say. I suppose you know, young man, that an officer must stick to the end, and that it is the captain's duty to go down with the ship. I wanted more than anything to knock him on his pudding-like face. But the passenger is a guest on the ship, so I s If you think you have grounds for complaint, sir, please speak to the captain. Leaving him standing, I went to the bridge. Their permission to report, sir. The name of the ship we encountered is the Karlsruhe. Fortunately, the ship does not require assistance. The captain slowly turned his head to me and asked, what do you mean by fortunately? You are pleased, aren't you? If you had looked properly, nothing like this would have happened. Oh, I don't see what I'm guilty of, sir. He looked at me for a moment, then turned and went to the door. But he turned back to me again. The sea court will decide the guilt, he said, slamming the door behind him. I felt as if I had been hit on the head with a hammer. I turned to the first man standing next to me. Do you think this will go to the maritime court, sir? He shrugged his shoulder. Hmm, perhaps. What then? Don't worry, he said bitterly. The gentleman at the green table will always find a scapegoat. I had almost the same incident in the Gulf of Mexico. A raft was passing by one night, you know, that huge thing of logs that goes down the Mississippi. It cracked and groaned and went by. The next morning they said it was us that caused the wreck. It was supposed that the people on board were shouting for help. Five or six passengers at the same time reported that they heard it. 
If it hadn't been for the stoker spending his spare time at the rail and swearing, it was really a raft. There would have been a good mess. My throat was dry. Hmm, suppose I was found guilty. What would happen to me? Now do I know, he said impatiently. At worst you'd lose your license. We said no more, but stood side by side, looking ahead into the black, starless night. Losing your ID is the end. To endure all the hard work all these years and then be left without an ID is even less than being an ordinary sailor. That thought haunted me. At dawn the next day we raised anchor and arrived in Bremerhaven around eight o'clock. At the end of my watch, as I walked across the deck to my cabin, I met the hostile looks of some of the passengers, and a little girl came up to me and asked me seriously, Now are you going to jail now? The experts checked the damage and estimated it at 35,000 marks. After the repairs we continued sailing. For me this voyage was unpleasant. The captain avoided talking to me. He addressed me with a cold disdain which hurt more than loud reproaches. So I was surprised when one night he called me to the bridge. We were not far from San Francisco. The ship was surrounded by such a fog that we seemed to be floating in wet cotton wool. The captain was in the wheelhouse. He looked as anxious as a farmer surveying his drying fields. Natty Tan, can you get a radio bearing? Yes, sir. Then take it. I went to the bridge and took a bearing. The foghorn of the San Francisco sounded at short intervals, but no answer came from the white wall in front of us, although we were on the main track to the west coast. Returning to the navigator's cabin, I wrote down the bearing. The captain was looking over my shoulder. It's all rubbish, he said briefly. We're right here. He pointed with his finger to a place further west. I made no reply. Now go on, Prin, and get a bearing from the shore. All right, I said to myself. If you don't trust me, let someone else confirm it for you. In the radio room, I asked the nearest shore station to give me my coordinates. The new data pointed even further east than the ones I had received. See, the captain was waiting in the navigator's cabin. When I reported, he frowned. Are you out of your mind? Anyone with a bit of intelligence would realize that's wrong. Your bearing is wrong. Get a slide and took a new bearing. This position was exactly the same as the first bearing I took. The captain said nothing. He paced back and forth in the deckhouse with his hands behind his back. At last he made up his mind. I'll go in accordance with the shore bearing. Then we'll run aground within two hours, I replied. He stopped. If I go your way, I'll miss the pilot boat and run aground anyway. I knew I had nothing to lose. Sir, I suggest we go according to my bearing first and then we can adjust it with the shore bearing. He stared at me like an angry bulldog. All right, but if we run aground, look out. I'll get the maritime court to strip you of everything. He turned on his heels and walked away. I was alone in the wheelhouse. Outside, the fog was like a wall. No one was answering my signal. Inside, I felt a strange sense. I was afraid that I would get what was coming to me if things went wrong. I was well aware that the captain would carry out his threat, and I was pouring cold sweat. Half an hour later, I reported to the captain. No time to change course, sir. He's in. New course, 42 degrees. All right, make it 42, he replied, without looking at me, and then he was off again. If my bearing was correct, we should be very near the shore, and a pilot boat might be expected at any moment. But there was nothing to be seen, only night and fog. The officer of the watch poked his head through the door. The signalman reports five short beeps ahead, he said quietly so as not to drown out the signal. I joined him on the bridge. We listened carefully and heard on the left ahead a still faint signal in the distance. Ten paces away from us stood the captain motionless, a dark statue in the fog. Sir, the pilot's boat is ahead, I whispered. My voice trembled a little. It was my finest moment aboard the San Francisco. Do you think I am deaf? He replied. I've been hearing him for quite some time. I went back to the navigator's cabin. The captain followed me. Go down and get the pilot. And then as I was on my way out, he added, almost grudgingly. All right, 
you did the right thing. That was the highest praise I ever heard from him. From then on, everything was much more pleasant for me. On the return trip, he would let me off the bridge when we were still a hundred miles from shore. I was relieved of all duties. It was suggested to me that I should take a simpler view of things, as I would be needed in emergencies or if radio direction finding was required. But all the while I feared an inquiry in the maritime court. True, Bustler thought there would be no investigation at all because no one was hurt. We arrived in Hamburg. I went through the mail. There was no summons. Neither had the captain or first mate. I breathed more freely. In the evening, however, Captain Schumacher of the company came on board. He remained in the cabin with the captain for some time, and when they came out, the captain, passing by, said, There was investigation in the maritime court in three days. Print. That night I was on watch. That's good, because I couldn't have slept anyway. At nine o'clock, the old skipper came on board, an old man with a bald head and a beard as white as snow. I ordered a grog and some ham sandwiches for him. He talked about the old days, about how for twenty years he had commanded a ship twice the size of ours, and now he was old, there was no work. He was retired on 180 marks a month. He asked if he could have some sandwiches for his wife, and when I said yes, he carefully wrapped them up and tucked them away in his pocket with an embarrassed smile. I turned away. This was what he had come for. What would happen to me? Three days later, an investigation began in the maritime court. They'll tear us to shreds now, Bustler remarked. We stood in the dark, long corridor of the maritime court building in Bremerhaven. The captain, the first mate, myself and a few of the crew. The captain of the Carl's Shrew, he and his entourage arrived a little later and exchanged polite greetings with us. We stood in the dark passage in front of the brown door leading into the courtroom. The men from the car through, he were crowded round the window. Don't worry, Prin, they won't take away your ID, Bustler said soothingly. A thin elderly man with a sharp beard walked past. Everyone saluted. He accepted the greeting coldly and disappeared into the courtroom. Hmm, this is a state representative, explained the captain. A sort of state prosecutor. Team behind him walked several cheerful, red-faced men with briefcases. One of them gave us a friendly nod. And these are the expert appraisers, explained the captain, all from Bremen. Not so good for us hamburgers, said Bustler thoughtfully. Finally, a small man in a black suit slipped into the courtroom like a mole in a hole. The bear. We entered a long, gloomy hall. At the table sat the chairman and the experts. To the left was the state prosecutor. We stepped to the table and handed our papers to the clerk. I hope we'll see them again, whispered Bustler. We were invited to sit down. The president of the court opened the session by reading a description of what had happened. Then the captain of the Karlsruhe was called as the first witness. He stated smugly that the Karlsruhe had been anchored because of weather and engine trouble. He had done what was necessary. The ship's bell rang at short intervals, and when we were spotted he switched on the siren. After bowing to the court, he returned to his seat. He made a fine impression. Then it was our captain's turn. He explained that he could not see anything, as he was lying in bed with a fever at the time of the collision. Mm. In that case, asked the prosecutor, can you indicate whom you instructed to replace you? I did not know beforehand that I would have the flu, replied the captain hoarsely, and sat down. The first round was for the Karlsruhe. Bustler was called to the witness stand. He was treated harshly. Why did he not anchor when the weather was deteriorating? He replied that it was impossible to anchor while in the path of ships. Asked why he did not move more slowly. He explained that he was travelling at an average speed. The average speed was too fast, the prosecutor said. You should have gone slower. Bustler remained silent. What did you do then? I sent the fourth mate to clear the anchor. Who is the fourth mate? I stood up. So you were with Mr. Bustler on the bridge? The prosecutor asked, emphasizing each word with a tap of his pen on the table. Yes, sir. What time was it? Almost four. Matthew Eltov sighed. How many minutes to four? It was a trap. 
I felt it instinctively, but I tried in vain to guess what he was getting at. No, oh, three or four minutes, I answered, hesitating. He turned to the pilot. Hmm, sir, but you said it was a very dark night. The sky was overcast, it was snowing. The pilot nodded. The prosecutor turned to me again. His spectacles gleamed. According to my maritime experience, I think you need at least seven or eight minutes for your eyes to get used to the darkness. No wonder you couldn't see everything. But I did. The expert intervened. I beg your pardon, Commissioner, but when you were younger, your eyes got used to the darkness faster. I thanked him with my eyes, and the prosecutor made a face as if he had bitten off a pepper. All right, he said reluctantly, let's leave it at that. He turned to Bustler again. When did you really first see the cows through he? Hmm, the fourth officer reported it to me. Ah, yes, and what did you see, Mr. Preen? I saw a white fire burning high up. Now tell us how it happened. You were ordered to clear the anchor. What did you do? I ran forward and summoned the carpenter, I said, carefully weighing every word, and we went together to the cable stay. You were therefore directly occupied with the anchor? Yes, sir. Jim, with a triumphant gleam in his eyes, he concluded. Hmm. I suppose it didn't occur to you to look round first. I had nothing to say. The captain suddenly burst into flames. Why all these silly questions? The first mate ordered the anchor to be cleared, and so the first thing he should do is clear it, and that's all. On my ship men follow orders, that's all. His voice grew louder towards the end, and the chairman rang the bell. But I must ask you. All the same, I felt this round was ours. Bustler then had to give an account of his actions after the clash. He did this very well, detailing each one after the other, although the prosecutor tried to confuse him with questions. The session came to an end and the court withdrew. We walked back and forth down the corridor. What do you think will happen? I asked the captain, as the lot falls. Finally, we were called back into the courtroom. The judge read the judgment. Only the weather is to blame. Everyone else was in. It was like a weight had been lifted from my soul. As we walked down the stairs together, Bustler asked what I was going to do now. I am, I am now going to study to get my captain's patent. By the end of January 1932, I'd had passed my examinations and received my captain's patent. I thought it would be worth it to get over the last hurdle, and everything would go automatically from there. Instead, unemployed. After the examiner shook my hand, I grabbed a taxi and went looking for work. I applied everywhere, but everywhere was the same. Everyone shrugged their shoulders regretfully and sighed. Bad times, they said, and at best promised vaguely. Leave your name and we'll let you know if anything comes up. I stayed in Hamburg, because I didn't want to miss the slightest chance and lived on my savings. Finally, as I couldn't find a job, I decided to become a writer. I bought a hundred sheets of white paper, an English-German dictionary, and began to translate the tea clipper, one of the best books about sailing ships. But when I got to the fiftieth page, I was left without money and without car. My old mate from the Hamburg days, Harry Stover, helped me as best he could. He bought a star of David and told You can eat and drink as much as you want. I know Captain Prine will pay. His confidence was touching but I felt I couldn't go on like this. One evening I went to the railway station and bought a ticket for the night train home to my mother. I arrived in Leipzig on a grey February morning. As I walked up the stairs, my heart was beating high. It was not easy for my own pride to return home after eight years of absence with no money and no job. I rang the doorbell. Mum opened it. My boy, she said, and pulled me into the darkened hall. She had turned grey in recent years. Then we went into her workroom. Everywhere on chairs and on the table were models and samples for shop windows, sausages and hams made of wood. I looked at her in surprise. She smiled. I know you'll laugh at my pictures, but now I'm really painting hams. She made breakfast. Then I lay on the sofa and studied the newspapers, especially the jobs column. Everything was hopeless. There were hardly any vacancies. 
but there were thousands of job applications. Gradually, I felt that I could lie there unemployed for many days, weeks, perhaps years. I shuddered and sat down. Of course, I have friends, schoolmates, sons of successful people. After all, there must be something I can do somewhere. There must be a job. I just have to find it. After all, I'm healthy, strong, and not entirely stupid. By a mum. The job hunt began. From house to house, from office to office, always the same thing. Many were torn out of their normal way of life. They had to give up their studies and searched for a place in life, however precarious to somehow exist. And when they found it, they were horrified at the thought of losing it and sinking into the mire of unemployment. Any too many were as bad as I was. They walked around, knocked on doors that were always closed, and kept hoping for a miracle. The miracle was called work. She, on the third day of my wanderings, I met Hinkelhaus. He had studied law, but had not completed the course because the money had run out. But he wasn't defeated. He opened a legal advice bureau. Uh, Baskins and depart. You can be a manager, he offered. Only I can't pay you yet. If you give us a job, you'll get half. I agreed. The office was on Eisenbahnstrasse. It was a small bare room with two tables and five chairs and a sign on the door. Ernst Hinkelhus, Councillor of Justice. For the next eight days I regularly went there every morning with a bag of sandwiches in my pocket and returned late in the evening. Say apart from Hinkelhaus, I saw no one in the office. We had a long discussion about the evil times and the inability of the government which was allowing a huge part of the population to starve to death. This debate was stirring, but I soon realized that if this continued, by the end of the month my half of my income would be half of zero. Hinklehaus decided to look for clients, and I was to look after the correspondence and the office. I stayed alone in a small room, looked out at the grey street, at the rooftops and waited. Not a single client came. After eight days, the law office closed its doors and never opened them again. I was back on the street again. There was only one thing left for me to do. Turn to the aid office. I went to the old building on Georgian Ring. Several people were already waiting in a grey, dirty room. They looked utterly devastated as if deprivation had drained them, leaving nothing but a shell. Every time the bell rang, one of them got up and disappeared behind the door. Finally, it was my turn. Adjusting my suit, I entered. See a small man with hair as grey as Ash sat behind a barrier writing. He looked at me over his glasses with a tired and bored look. Name? Occupation? Date of birth? The pen squeaked, the nib slid slowly across the paper. Why come back after all this time? Because I was trying to find a job first. Well, that's what I thought, he remarked, handing me a card. You'll get your first money in three weeks at the Gellertstra. What am I supposed to do until then? I asked. But he was already ringing for the next petitioner to come in. In the middle of March, I went to Gellertstrasse. At eight o'clock in the morning, a lot of people had gathered. The long queue moved slowly in small steps. This procession of poverty moved in a strange rhythm, enforced by the shuffling of rubber soles. It was my turn. I pocketed a few coins and hurried away. The queue got even longer. The sight of those stupid faces, the acrid smell of poverty, the endless shuffling of rubber soles was the most depressing thing I had ever experienced. I left. Now I'm back at the bottom again. Why do I have to endure all this? The years in the sailing fleet were no picnic, and now that I've finally got my patent, the earth is opening up beneath my feet. Life is over at twenty-four. Why? If you ask anyone, they'll shrug their shoulders and say, well, what can you do? No work. It happens, my boy. Damn it, what about the people in the offices, ministers, party leaders and officials? Isn't it their job to make life change for the better? How can they sleep soundly when so many strong and healthy and eager to work are disappearing like rotten straw? The few coppers they throw in can only sustain us, and even this money they give reluctantly, simply because they fear our desperation. They spend the money on newspapers oozing beautiful phrases and empty declarations. Yes, they can sleep, these gentlemen. They sleep well on soft pillows. They have a slogan, live and let live. But reality has torn the tinsel off their phrases. We see life as it is and we see them as they really are. 
Live yourself and let others die. That is the true meaning of the slogan of our leaders. I was seized with fierce indignation against the soft lying indifference. I joined the National Socialist Party. I enlisted in the Voluntary Labour Corps. To be sure that I would be accepted, I wrote to the leaders of several camps at once. They all refused as I was too old at 24. However, the camp leader Voxberg Lamprecht decided to give me a try. If you agree to become an ordinary volunteer, he wrote, you are welcome to come. Three days later, I set out for the camp. The journey was tedious. There was a half-hour halt at Plavne, and I walked round the little town with its cobblestone pavements and white wooden houses. The day was hot and dusty. The leaves had already withered. I felt depressed. When I went to sea, I felt joy. But now I would work without enthusiasm. Of course, any work is better than sitting idle. But after I had surrendered my body and soul to the sea, I was out of my element on land. In the garden of the villa I saw a beautiful blonde girl in a white dress. I knew there was more than a garden fence separating us. Inspiration struck me. I set my suitcase down, crossed the road to the flower shop, bought a bouquet of roses and walked straight into the garden where the girl sat. The wrought iron gate creaked as I opened it. The girl looked up. I walked across the lawn to her, placed the flowers in her hands, leaned in and kissed her. Her mouth opened in mute amazement. I stood for a moment looking at her, then turned and walked away. Outside the gate I picked up my suitcase, and without looking back I walked down the street straight to the railway station. In the afternoon I arrived in Old Schnitz. The labour camp was housed in a castle overlooking the town. This gloomy building had previously served as a women's prison. The windows were still barred, and inside... The cells adjoined each other like beehives. The guard on duty led me to the commandant of the camp. We passed many doors. The iron platforms rattled under our footsteps. The duty officer knocked on a door and opened it. I found myself standing directly in front of Commandant Lamprecht, a tall, thin man with a stern face. Ah, it's you, Prin, he said, the young man who wants to start as a regular volunteer. Yes, sir. He held out his hand. Then I salute you as a comrade, Prin. Go to the intendant's office and find yourself something suitable. Tell him you are assigned to the Hunsgrun group. Another handshake and I was outside. I was given a worn military uniform. Then I was shown a bunk and a locker. The dormitory accommodated seventy men. It was a wide, well-lit hall where the prisoners' workshop used to be. I laid out my things and waited, keening the groups were still working and would not return until five o'clock. I heard them in the distance. They marched with song into the castle courtyard and rumbled up the stairs to the hall. When they saw me, they stopped. A small emaciated lad asked, Are you the sea captain? Yes, why? We heard a long time ago that you were going to come. He stuttered and hid behind the others. I looked around. Almost all of them were young lads of about nineteen to twenty, weavers from the big carpet factory by the station. Most of them looked frail and emaciated. They all had a depressed look, like people who live in constant fear for their daily bread. They looked at me curiously, but asked no more questions. The next morning the duty started at 5.30. The groups lined up in the courtyard and received the day's rations, which consisted of bread, butter, sausages, cheese, and a flask of a lukewarm black liquid that was considered coffee, and called Negro Sweat. After breakfast we travelled to the work site on foot or by lorry depending on the distance. The Hans grown group had to walk. We passed through Olschnitz and walked along the main road into the Elster Valley. The building site where we were working lay next to the village of Hansgrun on a long sloping lawn that sloped gently down to the river. Below we could hear the muttering of the watermill. Higher up to the top of the hill stretched the forest. In our job was to drain the meadow. We had to cut pieces of sod and dig a narrow ditch exactly four and a half feet deep. From eleven to eleven thirty we took a break, sitting on stumps at the edge of the woods, eating greedily and chatting with each other. After lunch we continued our work until two thirty and returned to the castle. At five thirty we got lunch, which turned out to be the only hot meal of the day. After that, there was free time, unless the commandant decided to hold an hour-long drill. 
Thus went the day after day, and little by little I began to get used to my new life. Only evenings and Sundays were boring. Before the windows of the castle there was a wide view. The peaks of down were thickly forested and lost in a distant bluish haze. It was like high green waves, rolling in from afar and stiffening. I thought of the sea and felt nostalgic. One morning everyone was terribly agitated. The camp steward had disappeared. Everyone ran round the castle, shouting, calling for him, but he didn't answer. Finally we, we went from cell to cell. Behind each open door we were greeted by cold and the smell of mould as most of the cells were up. They remained as they were when the castle still served as a prison. Finally we found him in a cell in the left wing. He was lying on a cot with a gas pipe in his mouth. To prevent him from dying, he had taped his nostrils and the corners of his mouth with plasters. But dying was hard for him. His right hand gripped his throat, as if at the last moment he wanted to tear death away from him. We opened the door and windows and carried him outside. Then we called the doctor and did CPR for a while. It was all in vain. He was dead. The body had already stiffened. The important question was, why did he do it? Someone suggested he'd squandered the money. But we checked the books and accounts. Everything was in order. We checked his locker. There was a stack of letters from a girl. The last one came three days ago. She wrote, I've been waiting for four years and I can't wait any longer. You can't get a job and by the time we can get married I'll be an old woman. It's always the same. Desire, poverty, despair and the future is grey and merciless. One must be very hardy to endure it all. Immediately after lunch I was ordered to report to the commandant. He was standing on the iron platform outside the cell, with the leaders of the Hunsgrun group in front of him. Hmm, Sir Comrade Preen, said Lamprecht, you will take charge of the Seventh Party. And what, Rizzler? I asked. Up to now he has been the leader. Mm, I'm appointing him steward. I clicked my heels and left. It was good that I was beginning to make progress, but my pleasure was marred by sadness. At morning formation my appointment was officially announced and we went to work. Life hadn't changed for me. I was still cutting sod and digging ditches. As the year passed slowly, our labour became much harder. October came with fog and rain. We floundered in the mud and got caught in the rain more than once on the way to the castle, so that we came back wet to the boat. We were often checked by the head of the land commission, a long skinny man, a real office rat. He went here and there criticising everything and playing the role of a benefactor, since the labour service received subsidies from the local treasury. One morning he arrived accompanied by a fat, bald man, who turned out to be an inspector from the Saxon Ministry of the Interior. They walked round the meadow with the team leader, lingering here and there and making derogatory remarks. I was sure they didn't have the slightest idea about drainage, especially this fat one from the ministry. He would have been incapable of even lifting a piece of turf. It had been sprinkling rain all morning, but then it began to pour in earnest. A dense cloud hung over the top of the hill, and it rained like a wall. By unwritten law we were supposed to keep working in the rain, but as it poured down we hid in the builder's hut at the edge of the forest. The inspector and the man from the ministry were already there, but we were still working. Everyone looked at the team leader, but he wasn't going to let us go. People began to grumble. I threw down my shovel and went to him. Nesikales, how long do you want to keep us in the rain? He shrugged his shoulder. I can't do anything as long as the inspector is here. If you haven't got the guts, why don't you leave and I'll do everything for you? Will you do it? Of course you will. Then I hand everything over to you, he said with visible relief. I waited until he disappeared into the woods, then blew the whistle. The men ran towards the hut, and I followed them slowly. The inspector started cursing as soon as I interrupted. Uh, so what are you thinking of, disbanding the men? Mm, it's raining, I replied. He took a deep breath. A fat man from the ministry entered the conversation. Where is your leader? Nears we went to lay eggs. He stared at me in surprise, then order the men to start work immediately. I have not the slightest intention of doing that. I am officially ordering you. I get my orders from the camp commandant.
let's see, said the inspector. Your surname? I am Party Chief Prin. He took out a notebook and wrote down my surname. Well, are you going to order the men to work now? I already said no. Why no? The fat one asked. I am responsible for people's health. The inspector supplied. That's enough, and turned to the fat man. Let's go, there's no reason to stay here any longer. They went out into the rain and walked, keeping close together across the meadow to the motorway, where a car from the ministry was waiting for them. When we returned from work, I was summoned to see the camp commandant. The fat one from the ministry and the thin inspector sat in Lamprick's room with a look of hypocritical solemnity, like a pair of schoolboys who, having sneaked up on the teacher, are waiting to see the punishment of the guilty party. Mzi, please explain what happened at Hunsgrun, Comrade Prin, Lamprecht said sternly. I briefly described the events to him. Is that correct? he asked the waiting men. Both of them nodded. Since the team leader left us on Monday morning, I am appointing you in his place, Comrade Prin. I absolutely agree with what you have done. Me disgraceful, gasped the ministry official standing up. The inspector stood up too. You'll regret this, Lamprecht, he shouted as he walked away. Nothing more happened. Four weeks later, Lamprecht went on holiday and left me as his deputy. My nomination as team leader had left the camp relatively calm, but the latest appointment had infuriated many. The older ones, who had been in the camp for more than two years, felt particularly hurt. True, they said nothing, but when addressing me, they spoke in a strictly official manner. I was too busy to worry about their feelings. I handled the clerical work in the morning and spent the rest of the day hurrying on my motorbike from one construction site to another. One evening I received a call from a miller who owned a mill near Huntsgrun. His ham had been stolen, and the theft was probably committed by one of the group working there. When did you discover the theft? Three days ago. I promised to look into it and hung up. This is bloody embarrassing. If the ham was stolen three days ago, it's probably eaten by now. Best of all, the bones will be found. Under the circumstances, the formation could hardly help. In the evening, when the lights went out, I made a search of the lockers. I walked with a lantern from locker to locker, from bed to bed. The ham was found under the straw mattress of the boy from Dresden. It was completely untouched. Not a single piece had been cut off. I ordered the group and squad leaders to report to me together with the boy, small, pale, with protruding ears. In his black eyes lurked the terror of a beaten dog. Did you take the ham from the mill? A long pause, then almost inaudible. Yes, sir. Why? Silence. I walked up to him. Why did you steal? He began to cry. He cried silently. Only his face wrinkled and tears rolled from his eyes. He didn't say anything. Why don't you answer? He tried once or twice to say something, but choked on his sobs and fell silent completely. It was clear that he couldn't get anything out of him. All right, I said. Ham stays here and you leave camp tomorrow morning. You'll be the first to leave, you understand. You don't have to be at the formation. He clicked his heels together, standing still. Tears were still rolling down his face. Now that's one thing I never thought I'd see, the team leader said as the boy walked away. After both leaders left, I lay down on my bunk and thought about what had happened. What a shame that it all happened while I was in command. There was a knock on the door. Montaigne. Mantai, one of the senior workers, stood in the doorway. In the flickering candlelight his face looked stern, almost angry. I wanted to talk to you, Comrade Prin. I sat down. May please. I'm here about the bloke who stole the ham, he said. What's that got to do with you, and why didn't he come himself? He's roaring, he answered briefly. Mantai was one of the older men here, nearly twenty-three a miner from the Rue Her, a socialist, one of the best workers and a good comrade. Hmm, he said you ordered him to go away. He went on, and I want to ask you to let him stay. I can't. The boy is a thief. Eh, uh, so he stole the ham, replied Montez sharply. 
because he needed money, his mother was ill, and he wanted to send her some. Do you believe it yourself? Yes, he answered with conviction. To tell the truth, I believed it too. This poor roaring wretch was no ordinary thief. That was as much as I could understand people, and the fact that Mantide asked for him was a good sign. But there m I couldn't allow it, no matter how much I wanted to. Look, I said as friendly as I could. You should know that if I leave things the way they are, every son of a bitch is going to come in and say, You closed your eyes the other time you stole the ham. Why aren't you doing it for me too? Then what? No, the guy should be punished. And besides, imagine the impression it would make if people started saying that the volunteer labor corps was a gang of thieves. I don't care what they say anywhere, he said gruffly. You don't seem to want to realize what impression it will make on the boy. When the poor lad comes home to his sick mother and unemployed father and says he was kicked out, because he's a thief, he'll have a hard time dealing with it. You can be sure of that. I stood up. We were the same height and looked each other straight in the eye. That's enough, I said. I've made up my mind. The matter is closed. Now go to bed. He stood for a moment with his lips pressed together, then turned and walked away. I was alone again. For the first time I realized the dilemma. On the one hand, the fate of the individual. On the other, the well-being of society. I decided in favor of the second and I knew that I would always decide that way, no matter how difficult it was. He was not present at the morning formation, and as far as I could make out, he had left before the work began. I noticed that the men in the columns looked disgruntled but said nothing. I hoped it would all work out in the end. I had not yet gained enough experience in leading people, and did not know that any confrontation should be stopped at once, lest it drag you down like a swamp. When the workers returned in the evening, there was a hot meal waiting for them. I entered the dining room when everyone was seated at the table. Good evening, I said. No one answered. They were talking quietly, and at the same time feverishly among themselves, leaning towards each other. Suddenly a short laugh was heard. A hoarse voice at the end of the table said loudly, We'll salt his ham for him. I raised my head and looked in the direction the voice was coming from, but I couldn't tell who was speaking. Hey, after lunch, everyone line up in the classroom, I ordered. It was quiet for a moment, then the whispering resumed louder than before. I felt that this was a test for me. If I failed, I would be at their mercy. It would be the end of discipline in the camp. I realized that I must not disappoint Lamprecht in this way. Half an hour later everyone gathered in the room where the meetings were held. It was November. It was already dark outside. Shadows moved along the white walls in the candlelight. I confronted them. Hmm. Comrades, you all know what has happened. I'm obliged to expel one from our ranks because he is a thief. I know many find this punishment too cruel, but I am forced to be cruel in the interests of us all. There was a murmur on the benches at the end, growing by the minute. I was silent for a moment. They continued to grumble. Then I roared as loudly as I Whoever doesn't like it can get out at once. So shuffling of feet, someone stood up, followed by another, and then thirty men came out. Mantai was one of the first. I handed the group over to their leader and followed the thirty myself. Line up in the courtyard, I commanded. They obeyed reluctantly. In half an hour you will receive your belongings and leave the camp. You are no longer part of this camp. Anyone who is here later is a trespasser. Dis then I returned to the hall and informed the others. They met the news in silence. No one dared to comment. I went back to my room. I felt unhappy because I felt sorry for those who were leaving and sorry that the end of camaraderie had come. It was an unpleasant incident that caused me regret, but I got through it. The work went on as before. A few days later I heard that the Navy was giving merchant seamen an opportunity to join. All this time I had been dreaming of going back to sea. Now the dream had completely taken over me. I joined the Navy at Stralsund in January 1933. Again I started from the bottom as a simple sailor. Chapter 8 The Training of a Submariner when a man joins the army he begins a completely new life.
personal freedom is minimized. His place is determined by the word of command, by the iron discipline of service. The sailor is always on duty. All personal experience becomes unimportant in comparison. This is expressed by the old proverb. He who has sworn allegiance to the Prussian flag has nothing to call his own. My training was conducted in this spirit. Service and great political events overshadowed everything else. After my regular training, I was sent to the submarine school at Kiel. In the first few weeks of the course, we were stuffed to the teeth with theory. By the end of February, practical training began. The day we first went to sea in a submarine, I can remember quite clearly. It was clear and windy. A whole flotilla of submarines sailed in formation in the Bay of Kiel. Each submarine had several officer trainees on board. I was aboard the U-3. Arriving at the training area, we entered the central station through the combat deckhouse hatch. Despite all our theoretical training, we looked helpless in the narrow room. Blinding white lights gleamed in glass, nickel and copper, a tangled network of electrical and compressed airlines and various hand wheels surrounded us. In the center stood a periscope, and beside it a huge main compass. The noise of the diesel engines, which outside was barely audible over the noise of the sea. Here was so loud that you couldn't hear what was being said. Everything was vibrating. There was a piercing smell of steel and oil everywhere. We were received by the chief engineer. He gave us a short look and began his briefing. Never forget to report if you must go to the upper deck when the boat is preparing to dive. Otherwise you will suffer the fate of the legendary Lieutenant Muller, who discovered that the boat had gone out from under him. If it hadn't been for the air bubbles in his trousers, he would have sunk like a rat. A command came from the deck house. You dive. And responses from the station. Nose ready to dive. Midship ready. The stern is ready. The diving exercise has begun. The exhaust valves closed. The hatch cover fell down with a metallic clap. Never forget to close the valves, explained the chief engineer, lowering his voice, or else you'll have a disaster like the old U-3 in Heikendorf Bay. The trainee officers forgot to close the suction valve. Water leaked in and flooded the engine room. It short-circuited, filling the boat with deadly smoke. The commander suffocated. Many died, sadly. His words were interrupted by a buzzing sound. The electric motors started. Turning the helm, the fan started. The pressure test has begun. It felt like blood rushing to my ears. No one spoke just the continuous humming of the machinery and the frantic pounding of the steering gear, shakes demand from the deckhouse. Prepare to blow the tanks. Nest tanks ready. Blow out the tanks. Four men on their knees turned the levers downward. There was a hissing sound, air escaping. Water gurgled in the tanks. The boat slowly tilted forwards, then backwards. It felt like floating on a balloon, so at last she stood on an even keel. There was dead silence. No one spoke, no one allowed himself to move. Only the commander in a quiet voice gave orders to the men working the horizontal rudders. Then, like a lift, the periscope went up. The commander called us one by one to the central station. It was the first time I was going to look at the world through the periscope. The horizon shrank to a small disk. The water splashed in waves before my eyes. Then we were shown how to operate the horizontal rudders with large helm wheels, turning like a coffee grinder. After we had swum underwater for some time, the commander ordered, All stations, the boat is sinking to the bottom. Rudder on the bottom, the depth of 21 meters. Watchman reports, 16, 18, 20 meters. Both engines stop. A weak tremor went through the whole boat. We lay on the bottom of the sea. Once when report. Diving depth 22 meters, pressure 2 tonnes. Say lunch at 12.30. Soup, rump steak and fruit for officers and crew. The food is good and plentiful, but the wardroom is small and tunnel-like. The occasional soft gurgle reminds us that we are 22 meters deep at the bottom of Keel Bay. From aft comes the sound of someone working a hand pump. What's that? Asks Schreiber, one of the trainees. The commander is silent, but the first officer grins and answers. 
collapse, someone is using the toilet. The hand pump throws everything out, but at 22 meters it's a job. His round face brightens with pleasure, he is enjoying the subject and has no intention of leaving it. But that's okay, he continues animatedly. Just imagine. You're at war and you have to control yourself in the name of Fatalland, because the substance can float up and reveal the position of the boat to the enemy. An old submariner from the First World War told me about it. They lay underwater for 36 hours and... Uh, perhaps with a little effort we can find another topic of conversation, suggested the captain. We remained on the seabed for two hours. Then the drill continued. We ascended in stages. First to periscope depth, then surfaced. We were a little tired because of the heavy air, soaked with carbon dioxide and the rancid odor of liquid fuel. Since then, I've been camping underwater many times, and the submarine has become a familiar place for me. But the memory of the nerve-wracking camping trip is still vivid. Things and people are remembered more clearly when you see them for the first or last time. At the conclusion of my training course, I was posted as first officer on the U-226 boat, under the command of Lieutenant Commander Hartman. Mm, sharp as a razor, remarked an old comrade, but can teach you a lot. The U-26 submarine was stationed at Bremen. I cut short my journey at Hamburg and went to the Star of David to visit Harry Stover, the bosun of the Hamburg. I always remembered his help during unemployment when he gave me both food and drink. In the afternoon, the Star of David was empty. A dyed blonde woman slouched behind the bar. Is there two large pale ales and a master, please? I asked. She looked at me in surprise, disappeared and returned with a small fat man, fastening his trouser buckle as he walked. It wasn't Harry Stover. What can I do for you, sir? He asked. I want to find Harry Stover. Nath, I'm sorry, sir, he said regretfully. Harry Stover is dead, died two years ago. He turned to leave. No. So how did it happen? He hanged himself. Hanged himself? Why? I pointed to the second glass. The owner nodded and sat down. You know, old Stover wasn't a businessman. He lent money to everyone on the security of blue eyes. He hardly had anything left at the end to keep from starving himself. Business is a learning curve, you know. People think all you have to do is stand behind the counter and serve beer. I said thank you and walked out. All the way to the railway station I thought about Harry Stover. I wondered why he didn't go to his friends for help. He helped a lot of people, but when he needed help himself, he hanged himself. Stover was happy helping others, and too good-hearted to hold his own in this rough world of traders and speculators. I left by the next train, and on arriving at Bremen went at once to the shipyard. The boat was close to the quay, moored to a raid barrel. From the height of the quay she seemed very small. The commander received me in his cabin. He was a stout, wire man with sharp features. Lieutenant Prin had come to serve on the U-226. He stood up and shook my hand. It's good to see you. I've been expecting you, but there's nothing to do here now. Do you have a place to stay? I instantly assessed the situation. Yes, sir. Very well. Then come back in a week. I thanked him and left. It seemed these days that I was going back in time. On my way home, I met a non-commissioned officer. We got to talking and he showed me a photograph of the group at the New Year's Ball. Among the unfamiliar faces, I saw one familiar we, a girl from the garden in Plavny, whom I had kissed and given roses. This incident was still fresh in my memory. I asked the non-commissioned officer to give me her address and wrote to her. The reply soon came. She thanked me for the letter, finding it amusing, but claimed that she had never been to Plavny. Six months later we were married, and I never once regretted it. Like a... My holiday turned out to be short. Three days later I was summoned by telegram. We're going to Spain, said the commander when we met to defend German interests. His face shone with joy. The boat was quickly converted for the war. Supplies, fuel, ammunition came on board, and the next day we put to sea. In the channel we loaded for trim. I was at the center post. The post's report. No. Clear for diving. Torpedo crew report. All clear.
the command follows. No. Then a sudden shout from the torpedo hatch. You. I ran to the bow. The torpedo had slipped out of the apparatus and was sticking out of the hatch. Four men, panting with exertion, were trying to push it back in. It was clear that they could not hold it for long. See, the weight of the torpedo was pushing them back step by step. If the stern tilted even a few degrees, the shell would slip through the hatch, crush the men, and blow the boat to pieces. I rushed back. Oh, the fish has slipped out. I shouted to the watchman. He understood. The steering wheels of the horizontal rudders buzzed. Back to the torpedo, I pushed it with all my weight. The boat slowly lay on an even keel, and just as slowly, inch by inch, the torpedo slid back into the apparatus, until at last the lid closed behind it with a metal ring. Mm. How did that happen? I asked. The non-commissioned officer stood before me wet with sweat. The veins on his forehead swelled like ropes. I don't know, sir. He was panting. I was cleaning the torpedo and closed the lock, but I think the bolt was stuck. Did you report ready to dive prematurely? He pressed his lips together. Yes, sir, he said almost inaudibly. When I reported it to the commander, he sent for the non-commissioned officer and whipped him half to death. Later at breakfast, he said quite indifferent. This is one of many troubles. After all, a submarine is not an almshouse for the elderly. There were many incidents on the trip. In the Bay of Biscay, we got into the worst storm I've ever experienced on a submarine. As I stood on the bridge, wrapped in a heavy cloak, the sky seemed lead grey and the sea black as ink. So the boat struggled through the hissing waves, the rain whipping our faces. From time to time, the waves slammed into the ship, and we found ourselves waist deep in icy water. But that was only the beginning. Seas of sea rose higher and higher before us, more and more menacing, dark, streaked with foam. Then came crashing down on us with all the force of a waterfall. We put on our life belts and fastened them to the handrails. The commander stood forward on the fighting deck house, head bowed and clutching the handrails with his hands. He seemed to be charging like a bull against the waves. The diesels were running. Every time we crested a wave, the propellers spun in the air. The smooth wall of water rose higher in front of us than before, and we disappeared under the water. When we came up again, spitting and coughing, one man was missing. The petty officer on the bridge, see the fastening of his belt had broken, and he was thrown over the rail like a wet swimming costume. In one leap, the commander rushed to him and grabbed him by the scruff of the neck. The petty officer and two others were sent down, and the commander and I were left alone on the deckhouse. The height of the waves was increasing. At times they were so high that only the heads of the men on the bridge could be seen above the water. We had no choice but to dive. In the next moment of calm, we dived into the hatch of the fighting deckhouse. Streams of water rushed into the boat. We switched on the sump pump and finally submerged. The lower we descended, the quieter it became, until we could hear nothing but the noise of the boat and the high howl of the electric motors. For many hours we floated underwater, and when we came to the surface the storm had subsided. The morning was grey. The dark Spanish coast rose steeply before us. Not a light could be seen, only the moon shining through the tattered clouds. The navigator was cursing, for he could not determine our position. All he could say was that we were somewhere between Bilbao and Santander. We began our patrol, cruising between Pizajas and Cape Finister. The sea was deserted, although we spotted a few clouds of smoke over the horizon. The land lay dark and silent. Only when the wind blew from the shore did a distant firing sound reach us. These sounds stirred the blood and awakened the desire of every true soldier to be there fighting. But the time had not yet come. Only once did the war come so close to us that we felt sure we would be drawn into it. It was at Bilbao. Signalman shout. Oh, two warships on the bow on the left. The commander and I were on the bridge. We recognized the cruiser Admiral Sedera and the destroyer Balastro, Franco's ships, coming towards us at full speed. Huge waves were foaming at their bows. Looking at them through binoculars, we saw their guns slowly turning towards us. Perhaps they mistake us for Republicans, said the commander. 
perhaps the situation was complicated. I looked at Hartman. What is he going to do? If we change course, they'll take it as a retreat and open fire. If we get close, they'll assume we're attacking. If we dive, they'll throw depth charges at Mep stop both engines, the commander ordered. Tree laid a drift and bobbed on the waves with the flag up. The searchlight signaled at three second intervals. German, German, German. In vain, they continued onward. It's getting hot, I said, running my finger under my collar. The commander laughed. The muzzles of their guns looked straight at us, but when we were about a mile and a half away, the ships turned and the guns returned to their usual position. They sailed past us, flags lowered in salute. I received my first command in the autumn of 1938. At last I was captain of my own ship. I went to Kiel in December and met Lieutenant Commander Sobe, the flotilla commander, at the mothership Hamburg. He received me in his cabin. Have you seen your ship yet? Not yet, sir. He smiled and his sharp grey eyes studied me. Have you met the crew? No. Well, then you'd better go and see them. We shook hands, shouted Heil Hitler, and parted. My ship was still in the dockyard being finished. It was a beautiful boat with smooth lines. I went on board and, burning with pride of ownership, checked every detail from bow to stern, then went to the senior lieutenant and ordered to schedule a commanding officer's inspection for ten o'clock the next morning.